Well, good morning. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and make your way to Romans chapter 4. And uh, if you don't have your Bible with you this morning, uh, there is some Bibles in the pew backs in front of you. <clears throat> and then our text, of course, will be on the screen this morning as we uh, read through it. <clears throat> so we want to pick up where we left off. Previously, we saw Paul going to great lengths to communicate that the righteousness of God is only obtained one way. It's only obtained through faith in the Son of God, whom God gave as a payment for sin. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it, I, I've said this before, when you tackle large portions of Scripture that really cover the same thing, sometimes you feel like you're saying the same things over and over and over, and, and there's a level of where I do feel like I'm kind of being redundant um, but then at the same time, when I step back and I kind of survey the landscape of, of Christianity today, and, and as I uh, live life with people, I'm reminded of just how often we need to hear some of the same things over and over and over. And, and the truth is, guys, one of the saddest things um, that, that I think I encounter lots of times is how many people, based on what they say and, and, and how they think, which is determined by what they say, so many people, I think, have, have absolutely attached their works to their faith for their salvation. And they're, they're lumping those things together. And as I think through some of that, and I think about just what length Paul is going to, if we go all the way back to where we started a few weeks ago in chapter 3, verse 20, uh, 21, where we picked up and we've been moving through now all the way into chapter 5, Paul's talking about this same idea of justification through faith alone, through faith alone, through faith alone. And, and so... You know, sometimes I do feel like I say the same things over and over and over, but I, I guess if Paul can say the same things over and over, um, I can say the same things over and over as well, and trust that it's what we need to hear. Trust that it's, that it's what God is going to use to teach us, even as we just saying the realities that, you know, honestly, guys, if there's something that it really could transform the lives of people who profess to be believers in Jesus, it would be the reality that they would firm to, that they would come to firmly grasp and understand that salvation is by grace through faith alone. So many people work and strive. If you say, hey, how do you know you're right with God? So many times I've asked this question, and more often than not, the initial response that I get is something attributed to what the person is doing not how we're saved we're justified or we're saved by grace through faith and so i hope this morning you're not thinking man pastor we're, we're talking about this salvation and justification oh, through faith again i hope that that's not um your heart's perspective this morning um but if it is uh, i would encourage you to take just a moment even as we keep going and just pray that god would clear your mind he would clear your heart and he would uh, challenge you and he would he would speak to you through his word and his spirit this morning um, that, that you would hear whatever it is that you may need to hear as we have this conversation about salvation being through faith. And this salvation that Paul is, has been writing about and, and going to great lengths about to communicate being by faith only, you know, we saw that Paul has also went to great lengths to communicate that this salvation, uh, as Paul writes to his readers, it's not about them. It's about the God who has accomplished through Christ their salvation. It, it's about uh, uh, God's grace and God's mercy and that he chose according to his grace and his mercy to make this salvation or make this justification available to mankind. And therefore, for those who have it, it, it removes the ability for them to boast. We don't boast on our, in our salvation and our justification because of our own doing. Uh, but if we are to boast, we boast, we reminded Paul saw last week, or we saw last week, Paul told the Corinthians that if you are to boast, boast in the Lord, boast in him alone, not in yourself, not in your own doing, not in, in, the, in, in what you have and what is in your possession when we think about salvation, but boast in the Lord and what he has done in making salvation available to you. But Paul also, last week we saw, sought to remind his readers that that as much as they're not to boast, their salvation isn't just about them. It's not just 
for them. It's not just for those who claim to know Jesus, and we talked a little bit about this. Sometimes if we're not careful, those who know Jesus can become more concerned with just waiting for Jesus to come back than they are with, with helping people who need Jesus to know that Jesus is coming back right? And so our salvation, we don't boast in it because it's about God and it's about what he's done, but we also don't keep it to ourselves. It's not just for us, it's for all people. Whosoever will is what the scriptures teach us. And so we want to live our, our lives in such a way that we're, we're, we're demonstrating to people, we're encouraging people, we're drawing people into this relationship with God because we understand who he is and what he has done and that we have that relationship upon that basis and that basis alone. And so we pick up in chapter 4 this morning, that was finishing chapter 3, and Paul is going to continue, as we've noted, this discussion of justification by faith alone. It is apart from works. I will say it again. I will say it again next week and probably the week after that and probably the week after that. Salvation is through grace alone. It is apart from our works. Paul has worked out very plainly that God freely gives his righteousness as a gift to those who believe by faith. In an attempt to make it that much more clear for his readers, Paul will now demonstrate or illustrate what it is that he is trying to communicate by turning to the Old Testament scriptures. And so what, we're going to unpack just the first four verses of Romans chapter 4 this morning. Again, the text is going to be on the screen if you want to follow along there. I'll begin reading in verse 1 of Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not counted according to grace, but according to to what is due. So as you see, we're going to continue this conversation. And Paul wants to use Abraham as an example to demonstrate faith. And faith in God is an interesting thing. Because mankind, you and I, others like us, can talk all that we want about having faith in God. But the reality is that until it is proven out, do we really know that we have faith in God and all that he has revealed? We can say we believe God, but until we have to demonstrate that we believe God, that we trust him, we're operating, you ready for this, on faith. Faith that we have faith in God, that we believe in God. And so faith's kind of this, this interesting thing. You can't always see it until you have to live it out, right? Right? Uh, you, 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 you live your life based, we, we go day to day in, in some of the nuanced, easy, easier, if we can put it this way, realities of Christianity and following Jesus. But it's when life really presents itself in a way that's different than what we have desired or envisioned that our faith in God comes to light. Right? When, when, when something transpires in our life that we were not accounting for, maybe there's an accident, maybe there's a, a loss of a loved one, maybe there's a, a medical diagnosis, maybe there's just uncertainty about some things that are going on, maybe there's circumstances that we don't have much control over and we're trying to figure out what that looks like and we want to navigate them and with that comes some questions and some, some uncertainties. It's in those moments that our faith in what God has revealed in his word really begins to be bore out. Because when those things happen in our lives, and they happen in all of our lives, all of our lives, none of us are immune to this, is when we declare with our lives that we trust whatever it is God is doing. That's the demonstration of the faith that we claim to have. And so as we talk about having, our, 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 as we talk about having faith in God, it's not really until it's born out or until it's proven that we fully grasp and understand in this earthly sense our faith in God. You know, we've made much, even as I say that, I want to repeat some things that we have already said. We've made much about the reality that what we do in our lives is not what warrants God's favor for us. 
So if we say we trust him and then we trust him in difficulty, we don't get favor from him because we trusted him in the difficulty. Trusting him in the difficulty is the evidence that we trust him, that we do in fact have faith in him. And Abraham is a great demonstration of faith and what it looks like to live out that faith because you've received the righteousness of God. So understand that. Abraham lived by faith. It was our call to worship. Uh, Book of Hebrews, chapter 11. We call it the, the hall of faith. And Abraham is included in there. And we have this reality that Abraham demonstrated his faith. When the the going got tough, if we could put it that way, when the circumstances came in which he had to evidence that he did trust God, that's exactly what we see from Abraham, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that in in, in a few moments. But he lived out what he believed. I believe in God. And we're going to see this is what Scripture literally tells us about Abraham. He believed in God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And then the things that he did as he lived his life supported that he believed God. It wasn't that he did these things, and then God said, oh, you believe me, now I will give you faith. You guys tracking with me? Saying the same thing over and over and over each week. But it's not about what we do that gets us the faith. Faith comes as a gift from God, and what we do bears out the faith that we have. So let's look at a few things this morning. What claim, this is the first thing I want us to consider, what claim did Abraham have to God's righteousness. That's this first question that we look at. What, what claim was it that he had? And Paul uses a universally known example of Abraham to demonstrate his point to his readers that justification is not a result of works. Once again, Paul here works in such a way to remind his readers that there is no boasting. There's nothing for the readers to boast about. He does this by referring to Abraham. His question in verse 1 could be translated as this. What has Abraham's works of the flesh accomplished for his justification? What, what, What have the works of his flesh accomplished for his justification? Now, as we consider this phraseology here from verse 1 is Paul saying, okay, Abraham did some things, and what do they count towards his righteousness? I want us to examine what took place between God and Abraham that Paul might deem it appropriate to use Abraham as his example. And so to do this, I would invite you to hold your place here in Romans 4 and turn your Bibles back to Genesis chapter 15. It will be on the screen, but if you've got your Bibles with you, I always encourage you to to develop the habit of flipping and turning. We're going to go to Genesis 15, and we're going to see what transpires between God and Abraham that would compel Paul to use Abraham as an example uh, in our text this morning. So beginning in in verse 1 of Genesis 15, We read this, after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord Yahweh, what will you give me as I go on being childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, since you have given no seed to me, behold, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him saying, this one will not be your heir. But one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and he said, now look toward the heavens and number the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your seed be. You see, God made a promise to Abram that the heir of his house would not be Eleazar of Damascus, but that he himself would have a child to be his heir. And this might not seem... like that big of a deal that God would tell Abraham that he's going to have his own child that will be his own heir because after all kids are born all the time but if you know the account of Abraham and you're familiar with the old testament you know that when God made this promise to Abram Abram was 99 years old and this is what Abraham 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 is saying to God man how am I going to have a son in my old age I don't have one yet, and, and I, I, I don't have one, so who's going to be the heir? But because we're on this side of his, history, as we think about Abraham and his trusting of God, one of the things that I think it is important for us to note is it, Abraham was not perfect. 
We absolutely read in the scriptures, and we're going to unpack this in a moment, that Abraham believed God and it was trusted to him as righteousness. But we know that does not mean that Abraham always did everything perfectly. Okay? But nonetheless, what we know is he is upheld as an example biblically in history where, where God called people to himself and by faith they trusted him. And we know, even in light of everything, Abraham trusted God. How do we know this? How do we know that this promise from God to Abram in Genesis 15 was trusted by Abraham? Well, in Genesis 21, uh, God's promise to Abraham is, real, is realized and a son is born to him. Amazingly, when this son is born, he is 100 years old and his wife Sarah is 90. And then after chapter 21 of the book of Genesis, obviously comes chapter 22 of the book of Genesis. Flip over there with me and we're going to read a few verses from Genesis chapter 22 as we consider how do we know that Abraham trusted God. He didn't have a son of his own. God promised him that he was going to have one. And not only was he going to have one, but the one that he was going to have was going to be the father of all nations. That the descendants that would come from this child from Abraham's loins would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. This was the promise of God to Abraham. This son is born in Genesis 21. And you're thinking, what does any of this have to do with Abraham trusting God then we get to Genesis 22. Follow along with me. We'll read beginning in verse 1. Now it happened after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. This is the promised son from God to Abraham, whom the descendants from him will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And listen to what he says. I want you to take the son you love, Isaac, and go forth to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Now, I'm going to pause for a second. Because just in case you missed, when, when God tells Abraham, I want you to go and take your son and offer him his a burnt offering, don't miss what God is asking him to do. He's asking him to sacrifice his child on the altar. He's asking him to take the child whom he loves from his loins, born to him in an old age, who God has promised will be the, the, all of the descendants from him will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he says, Abraham, I want you to go to the mountain, I will tell you, and offer him there. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there, and we will worship and we will return to you. We're not going to unpack this today, but did you catch what Abraham said? Did you catch what he told his men? God has asked him to go and sacrifice his son on the altar. And Abraham tells the men who have sojourned with them to this mountain, stay here, we will go. And then what does he say? And we will come back. Now, I don't know how it is that Abraham reasoned in his mind that they would come back. I don't know what his logic uh, led him, what logic led him to say, we're both coming back. But nonetheless, this is his disposition as they begin to embark up the mountain. Then Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he put it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and put him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham, verse 10, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now this is unfathomable. 
And, and if you're familiar with what happened, we don't have time to read all of Genesis 22 this morning, is Abraham did what God called him to do. As Abraham takes these steps and he prepares to be obedient to what God had called him to, no matter how crazy it seemed to be, uh, an angel of the Lord says, Abraham, stop. And there's a ram stuck in the bushes. The ram would then be altered as, or offered as the sacrifice on the altar. And Abraham and Isaac would together go back down the mountain. But this morning we're talking about the evidence of Abraham's faith. He was prepared to do the most unthinkable thing. And he was prepared to do it for one simple reason. You ready? One simple reason. Because he trusted God. I don't, I don't know how to rationalize that. I don't know how to make sense of that. I just know that the word of God says, Abraham believed God by faith, and then we see the evidence of his belief in God. He trusted God. He trusted that God has said, one will come from your loins and he will be the father of, of all the descendants who will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. That doesn't happen without Isaac. But Abraham trusted God. Now again, for the sake of time, we need to return back to the book of Romans but the goal is to understand that even though Abraham demonstrated that he was willing to do the most unthinkable thing in his trust of God, it did not cause God to declare him justified. He, we do not look at Abraham and say Abraham was right with God because he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. No, we look at Abraham and we say Abraham's willingness to sacrifice uh, Isaac because God told him to do so, demonstrating his trust in him, is evidence that he's been justified by God. Please, please, please do not mix these things up. Because it was not about Abraham's actions. Had it been from his actions, man, he would have really had something to boast about. Because he was willing to do the unthinkable, even sacrifice his own son. But he can't boast. This is what Paul is saying to his readers in Romans 4. He can't boast because his justification is not based upon his actions. So we ask another question. What, were Ab what was Abraham's justification based upon? To answer this question, I want to ask a question that Paul himself asks. Okay? Secondly, I want you to see this reality. What does the scripture say? We think about uh, this question that Paul is asking. What was Abraham's justification based upon? What does the scripture say? Now, I want to pause for just a second, take a step out of Romans chapter 4, and just give you something that I believe is very practical and can be helpful in our lives day in and day out. This is the most relevant and important question that you can ask as you go through your life trying to follow Jesus. What does the scripture say? Do I do this? Do I do that? What does this look like? What does that look like? What does the scripture say? Know and understand that more often than not, scripture speaks in principles. We don't, get a, we don't get a whole lot of black and white. Yes, no. There is some of that, absolutely. But more often than not, scripture speaks principles into our lives that we live out, ready for this, by our faith. But this ought to be something that we ask ourselves with regularity. Pause with me for just a second and think about when was the last time you were navigating something in life and the first thing that came to your mind was, or it came to your mind at any point in time and you thought, what does the scripture say? As I'm navigating this, as I'm navigating that, and I'm trying to figure out how to do this and how to do that, what does the scripture say? This is an incredibly important question that we ought to ask often. And we're going to ask this question now, jumping back to Romans chapter 4, to consider this reality of Abraham. It's a straightforward question. What does the scripture say? Paul goes to the very source 
to answer his question and to provide his instruction to his readers. I don't know if this is on the screen or not, the next point, but just hear me say this next verse. As we try to answer this question, what does the scripture say? Listen to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So God has made this promise to Abram. We just looked at that. Yeah, there it is. Then he, Abram, believed in Yahweh, God, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So we asked, what was the basis for Abram's justification? If it's not his willingness to sacrifice Isaac, what is it? We ask the question, what does the scripture say? And the scripture says, Abram believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Aha, this is as simple as it gets. Now, it's practically, it's different as we live it out. It's not quite as easy. But as simple as simple can be, it says, he believed in Yahweh. And he, that is Yahweh, counted it to him as righteousness. So what has transpired? Where does Abram's justification come from? What's transpired? He believed God. He trusted what God said to him. And we must be careful to not mistake belief as a means of working for our salvation. Because sometimes that, 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 that line can get crossed, that, that, that it can become blurry. It's vital that we do not lose sight of the fact that justification has always been by grace through faith. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. Salvation, justification, has always been by grace through faith. Sometimes opponents of God's word today will say, well, God's not the same because the way people are saved in the New Testament is different than the way people were saved in the Old Testament. It's not at all. Salvation has always been by God's grace through faith in what God has revealed. There's not a new way of salvation in the New Testament. Paul says Abraham believed. He believed God. He believed what God had told him. I think sometimes simply we just need to ask the question, do we believe what God has told us? We want to work and we want to do all the things and we, and we lose sight of just the simple question, do we believe what God has revealed in his word? That's the matter at hand. And Paul uses another uh, familiar ideal or term or illustration to try to further explain his point and, and it's this idea of a bookkeeping transaction. It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Counted as righteousness. Counted is the word there that would encapsulate a bookkeeping transaction. And what's taking place is Abraham has a ledger. I have a ledger. You have a ledger. And those ledgers prior to Christ are full with, with our sin and all of the things that separate us from God and declare us guilty before God. But when a person believes, and right now we're talking about Abraham, but when Abraham believed, the ledger of his debt was wiped clean and it was instead filled with the, the ledger was filled with the righteousness of Christ. So now when God looks upon Abraham, what does he see? He sees the righteousness of his son. He sees his righteousness because he believed and his ledger was filled with righteousness instead of debt. Paul, referring back to Genesis, he does not say specifically what it is that Abraham believed. But what we can deduce is that whatever it was God revealed to him is what Abraham believed. We can see generally, we see some of these things. We've talked about some of what God revealed to Abraham. His actions demonstrate that he believed it. In short, what, what Abraham believed is that God was truthful. You trust someone who tells you something that you believe is truthful. You, you trust what they say, and the action in light of that demonstrates that you trust that. Abraham believed that God was truthful. He trusted him. And because he believed God, righteousness, God's righteousness, was accredited to him. We can say dogmatically, 
that Abraham was not saved by the works of circumcision or by keeping the law. And Paul's going to get into this further on in Romans 4. But we can say dogmatically those things didn't save him because it's in Genesis 15, 6 that we read <clears throat> where Abraham is declared justified. Circumcision was not instituted as the mark of the covenant until Genesis chapter 17, years after the declaration that he was a recipient of God's grace. And we know it wasn't a matter of keeping the law for Abraham because the law wouldn't come to be for almost 400 years after Abraham. And yet the scriptures tell us what? That Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham was justified not by works, but by his faith. And Paul uses yet another illustration in verse 4 to remind his readers of the difference between earning salvation and salvation being a gift. And so I want us to see together that wages are earned, grace is given. This statement from Paul is so simple and yet so profound. Any person who has ever had a job, and really even those who haven't had a job, but have parents uh, who do have jobs, they understand what Paul is communicating. If you are given something on the basis of your work, then you earned it. You mowed somebody's lawn, they gave you money, you earned that money. You went to work, you punched the clock, at the end of the week they gave you a check, you earned it, okay? If you do anything and are compensated in some way, it is an earning for whatever it is you have done, okay? You have earned those wages. You are being given that which you deserve. If you go to work and you do your job, you deserve to be paid for doing your job. This is something we all understand. Wages come as a means of earning them. If you earn it, it's not given. You understand that? If you have any part in, in doing any kind of work or operating in any way, any means towards whatever it is that you're going to be getting, it is no longer a gift. It is a wage. As we've said, if you go to work every day, at the end of the week, two weeks, pay period, whatever it is, your employer pays you because you've earned it. But it's October, two months short of December. December is probably the most uh, well understood time of year when gifts are given. So imagine you work all year long at your employer and every two weeks or week, whatever your pay period uh, setup is, you work all year long and every time your pay period rolls around, your employer gives you money based on the job that you've done. And then in December, not only do you continue to go to work and you get your wages, you get what's earned to you from working, but that it's your work Christmas party, your boss gives you a card and inside that card is a check for some money. Did you earn it? No, you didn't. It was a gift. Your employer decided to be a blessing to you. They may not have had those motivations, but that's a reality, right? Like your, 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 your employer wanted to be gracious and give you a gift. You did not earn your Christmas bonus. Okay, I'm not talking about incentive bonuses where if you meet goals, you get bonuses. That's different. I'm simply talking about the notion or the reality that your employer gives you a bonus, a gift. You didn't earn it. It's a gift that is giving because somebody is gracious. It's not a wage, it's a gift. And Paul seeks to make it as clear as he can that justification is not something that can be worked for or it would be a wage that God is paying when he gives it to you. And all throughout God's word, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, in matters of salvation and justification, we are reminded that it is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. It cannot be worked for. It is simply bestowed by God because of his grace through faith. Faith is 
the channel or the conduit where, by which we receive justification. Okay? As we live out, as we have faith when we believe what God has revealed, I, I, I don't, I'm going to say this, I hope you're going to track with me. Faith isn't what saves you. The righteousness of God is what saves you, but the only way the righteousness of God is received is faith. Faith is the conduit or the means through which God gives you his righteousness. So you can't be saved apart from faith. You can't be saved any other way than through faith. Because justification and salvation is a gift. And Abraham serves as a tremendous example of what it means to believe God. God has spoken to Abraham. Abraham believed what he said, and then his life demonstrated. God has spoken to you and I today through his word. I don't mean today, this day. I just mean in general. God has spoken through his word. And the question is, do we believe what God has revealed? Are we trusting in the fact that it's not something we earn, it's something that we are given? I want to finish as we consider Abraham's example, I want to finish with a few points of application. And the first one I'm going to tell you, as we think about this salvation of God being given uh, because he's gracious, not because it's earned. This first thing I want to tell you today, we didn't talk a ton about. I mentioned it, I referenced, and I think it's vital for the believer in Jesus Christ today to understand this. When we think about God's grace. God's grace is sufficient for the believer's failures. And I wanted to include that here as we think about Abraham because Abraham was not perfect. Abraham did not always do everything right. Nonetheless, we know the Bible tells us that God, or excuse me, that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Because the reality is, is when we're in Christ, look, I, I, I usually don't ask for crowd participation on a Sunday morning in a corporate setting, but I'm going to ask for some. I want you to do me a favor and raise your hand if you are perfect and you have never needed God's grace as you live life. Yet not one of us can raise our hand. Because as much as we want to say we believe in Jesus and we want to follow Christ and maybe we are and we're living our lives by faith, none of us are perfect. None of us do it right every time. And oftentimes we can look back and we can say, man, I really blew that one, God. Man, I really messed that one up. I want you to know just as much as God's grace is sufficient for your salvation and for your justification, it is just as sufficient for uh, the forgiveness that you need for your failures as you walk with Jesus. And it's important that we recognize this, right? We examined Abraham's faith. We mentioned briefly that he wasn't perfect. There were times when he strayed from trusting what God had revealed and you and i do the same thing we can wake up every day we can make sure we're reading our bibles we can seek to live our lives yesterday i'll give you guys a quick example um uh you guys know i'm pretty close with my dad right and uh, i talk about that often and and uh yesterday you guys many of you might know many of you maybe don't know but the tigers were playing in game five i'm born and raised in michigan so i'm a big tigers fan and my parents um are driving they're on their way to georgia we're actually going to meet them there today and and uh, we've got a week of vacation coming up where we're going to be with my family. And, uh, and so because my parents were driving, I've kind of been communicating with my, my parents what was going on in the baseball game. And, and I called my, my dad's phone one time, and my mom answered it, and I could tell like it was on speakerphone sitting on the center console as they were driving. And I was telling them something that happened in the game, and, and uh, Cleveland had tied it at one. And my dad just started ranting and raving about, all oh, the losers, their season's over. And I was like... Dad, you are so negative. Like, oh my goodness. He hung up on me. And I was like, what? And I even told Jenna later, I was like, what are we, like 14 and dating? What, you hung up on me? What, what are we doing here? Now, here's the reason I tell you that, okay? My dad is a professing believer in Jesus. And um, I, I honestly don't know that this has ever happened in my life. But, you know, when he hung up, it was fine. I didn't tell him that the very next pitch, Scooble gave up a grand slam. And the Tigers did, in fact, get beat. And their season is, in fact, over. But about 7 o'clock last night, I got a text, and it was my dad. 
and he said, I'm so sorry I hung up on you earlier. And he said, I'm just having a bad day. And they're traveling, and my dad, you guys think I'm wound tight? You should see my dad. And, uh, and so we text for a minute, and I just said to him, you know, it's, it's all good. I hate that you're having a bad day on your first day of vacation. He's like, well, I'm tired. I didn't get no sleep, and we're driving down here, and, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And, uh, you know, and I, and I say that because, you know, again, my dad is a professing follower of Jesus Christ. Um, but, but you know what? We all blow it sometimes. And I'm thankful that, that God was working in such a way in my dad's heart that my dad was re- recognizing, man, I blew that one. And, and he came to me. I don't, know if he went, I don't know if he went before the Lord, too. That's between him and the Lord. But he came to me, and he took ownership of his failures. Um, and so it's the same reality, guys, when we blow it, right? We have the ability to go before the Lord and, and seek his grace and seek his mercy uh, because we're going to blow it, but God's grace is sufficient. Secondly, I want you to understand this, and, and we're, in some ways, we're repackaging the same things, okay? But, but maybe we say it a different way, and, and, it, and, it, and it challenges our mind differently. Uh, I want you to understand this. Trying to earn your way to God is hopeless. We say over and over and over and over, salvation is by grace through faith, by grace through faith, by grace through faith, not of works, not of works, not of works, not of works. Know that trying to earn your way to God is hopeless, Good works will never satisfy God's standard of perfection. And so do not fall into the trap of believing that you need to work for your salvation. And and again, this happens subtly. We're very quick to say that we understand salvation comes by grace through faith. But when we're asked how we know we're right with God, we appeal not to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Instead, we appeal to the things that we're doing. And so we have to keep those distinct and be careful to make sure that we're not falling into the trap of believing that you need to work for your salvation. And we certainly have to be on guard against falling into the trap that we are able to work for our salvation. Not only do you not have to, and you need to be reminded of that, you're not able, and you need to be reminded of that as well. And so praise be to God that we don't have to work for our salvation because we can't do enough. Praise be to God that it's just according to his grace and his mercy. And lastly, sometimes I think things go uh, without being said, but I want to say it because it's always good to be reminded of of what scripture would teach us. As we talk about this faith, as we talk about having faith, um, we must always remember that mankind's faith must be placed in the gospel for salvation. It's where it comes from. God has revealed the fullness of the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That mankind, because of sin, was separated from God. And in that separation from God, deserved the wrath of God, deserved to be punished for all of eternity. But because he loved us, because of his grace and his mercy, he sent his son, we saw last week in chapter 3, to be the propitiation, to be the payment that would satisfy his demand to be the payment for sin, whereby believing that that is true, believing that God is trustworthy, that he has given what's necessary to be made right with him, that when we believe that, we can be brought back into a relationship with him. How do we know what he revealed in his word is true? Because three days after Jesus was murdered, he came back to life. God is trustworthy. We can believe what he has revealed. But if we don't, we just saw it's hopeless trying to get to God. We must believe that which has been revealed in the word of God about how it is that we are brought near to God. And that is faith through, or excuse me, faith in Jesus Christ. So the invitation of God's word is to trust God and have faith righteousness accredited to your account just like abraham it's not about our works it's about faith i want to finish with an illustration maybe it will help maybe it will not and i came across this in a sermon illustration book uh it was put together of illustrations that charles spurgeon had used and so i'm going to read it as it appears in the book and so he says this he says let me tell you a story that i heard the other day He said, I cannot vouch for its truth, but it serves as an illustration for me. 
He says there were two drunken sailors who wanted to go across a narrow scotch first. They got into a boat and began to row. And in their wild, drunken way, but they did not appear to make any headway. Sorry, they began to row in their wild, drunken way, but did not appear to make any headway. It was not far across, so they ought to have been on the other side in a quarter of an hour, but they were not across in an hour or even in several hours. One of them said, I believe the boat is bewitched. The other one said, he thought they were, and I suppose they were through the liquor they had been drinking. At last, the morning light came, and one of them, who had become sober by that time, just looked over the side of the boat and called out to his mate, you never pulled up the anchor. They had been tugging at the oars all night long, but had failed to pull up the anchor. Spurgeon goes on to say, you smile at their folly, and I do not regret that you do so, because you can now catch the meaning of what I am saying. There is a many a man who is, as it were, tugging away at the oars with his prayers and his Bible reading and his going to chapel and his trying to believe. But like the drunken sailors, he has not pulled up the anchor. That is to say, he is either holding fast to his own supposed righteousness or else he is clinging to some old sin of his that he cannot give up. You must pull up the anchor, whether it holds you to your sins or to your self-righteousness. That anchor, still down out of sight, fully accounts for all of your lost labor and fruitless anxiety. Pull up that anchor, and there will soon be a happy end of all your troubles, and you will find God to be full of tender mercy and abundant grace even to you. You see, your works, your self-righteousness are the anchors that keep you from getting to God. They keep you from receiving his justification. Again, our works don't make us right. They merely prove that we are. They're like anchors. They keep us from getting any closer to God if we don't yet have salvation. So be sure today that you're not trusting in your works. Instead, trust the gift of justification that is based upon one thing only, and that is the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the simple message of salvation that is received by faith. We thank you, God, for the examples of Scripture who believed you by faith. And we thank you for what Scripture tells us as we examine the life of Abraham. He believed you and it was accounted to him as righteousness. It wasn't because of what he did. It wasn't because of what he was willing to do. It was because... He trusted you. He deemed you to be truthful and his life demonstrated. Father, help us to distinguish our works from faith for salvation. Help us, Father, to see that our, our works, the evidence of our faith is just that. It's the evidence. It's not what gives us faith. It's, it's the evidence of our faith. And God, I pray that you would challenge our hearts and that you would encourage our hearts and, and challenge our minds as well to, to not become bored of this continued conversation of justification by faith. May you challenge our hearts in such a way, God, that we would celebrate the simplicity of your gospel, that we would boast not in our doing but in your doing, that we would celebrate, God, that you, according to your grace and your mercy, have not given us that, what, that which we've earned, God, but that you freely give according to your grace as a gift. Father, we praise and thank you today for the gift of salvation. Help us, Father, to see that our, our works and our self-righteousness and our own doing are, are merely the anchors that weigh our boats down and keep us from getting anywhere near you. And it's not until we draw those anchors and we set aside our works and we set aside our self-righteousness that our boat floats into the direction of the other side, which has got into this relationship with you. Father, challenge us wherever we may be today. Maybe it's that we need to lay aside our works and rest in you for salvation. Maybe it's that we need to, to be mindful that your grace is sufficient for our failures, that your, your grace isn't once and done, you give it to us for salvation, and then we lay it aside and that's it, it's over. But God, that you continue to walk with your people, 
that you continue to sustain them, and God, that you continue to give your grace and your mercy. So help the one today, God, who may be wandering. God, may they draw back near to you. May they rest in the promises of your word. Father, we praise and thank you again today just for the simple fact that your word bids anyone to come. And maybe today is the day that someone will lay aside their anchors and come to you in faith. God, stir our hearts today that we might respond however it is that you're bidding us to respond. And help us, God, no matter what that looks like, to boast that is to give glory to you alone because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand.